Hello, this is Anthony Andrews, and as part of the Who We Are Takeover, I'm very glad to um, introduce Akinola Davis Jr. to the conversation. So, Akinola, how are you? I'm fine, thank you, uh, all things considered. How are you doing? I know we've been trying to collaborate for a little while, um, for the last yeah. couple of years, so I'm really glad that you could be a part of this takeover. So, thank you very much for, for being a part of it. No worries, thank you for having me. So, I was going to um, ask you, for anyone who isn't familiar with you, and your work to tell us a little bit about yourself and, and some of the work that you've done. Sure. Um, so my name's Akinola Davis Jr. I'm a director, visual artist, writer, I guess new, newly found writer. Um, yeah, my background's predominantly been in music videos and fashion films. And then more recently, just like making the, and, and sort of abstract documentaries, as well as sort of like visual visual arts and more recently yeah making the jump to narrative stuff um i've done music videos for people like nena cherry and blood orange and kate tempest um as well as people like klein and larry b um what else uh yeah a lot of my work focuses on community uh, focus on focuses on the black image focuses on conversations I think I would like to see us having in our community and also just it's about me sort of trying to project the world that is project my version of what um, it means to be black effectively so, and uh, I mean, what, one of the things that's been really great for, for, for me putting together this project and mm. working and researching is being able to watch and rewatch some of the work that you've done. Um, so, you know, your work with, Ken, uh, with Kenzo, um, work with Blood Orange, as you mentioned, mm. um, that incredible piece of work that you did um, around Fela Kuti for Dazed and Carhartt, which was fantastic. I absolutely loved yeah. that. Um, and I think one of the things that I really like um, about your work is that it really does have a consistent theme running through it. And you mentioned community and I just wondered what does a project need to sort of have for you to really um, to, to allow yourself to work on? Um, I guess that's like a double <clears throat> double part question I mean mm. I think for a quick answer um, on the more sort of commercial side is that you know as a filmmaker I need to earn a living so on, on one side of it um, there is a lot of work that one would do where I would potentially be like responding to a brief, which in effect is kind of most music video stuff. But I think that maybe the thing that correlates to the more, the, the side that gives me more freedom is just, um, just being able to navigate the sort of topics I want to navigate um, and just being trusted to do so. I think for the most part, um, trust is a huge aspect of why I would do any project. And I think trust can quite quickly be established from how a client or a commission um, engages with you in terms of your knowledge of like the dialogue or anything like that. Um, I think there's a lot of jobs which try and like m micromanage, but I think predominantly is trust in order to be able to um, tell what I think is uh, an honest portrayal of like my community or, or the way I, I want to engage with the subject matter. Um, because yeah, I think that, that would be the, that would be the underlining factor for me in terms of any job. It's just someone who's like knows my work, has seen my work and trusts me to deliver something based on what we're collabor collaboratively, collaboratively trying to do. Um, so yeah, that's a, that's a big thing for me, trust. So, I mean, as this takeover is really a celebration and a mediation on Black British film, I wondered if we could uh, take some time to talk to you about live, how, you know, living in Britain and more specifically in your case, living in London and working in London has mm. had an effect on your work and influenced your work. So could you talk to, to us a little bit about that? Sure. It's a bit of a difficult question because I, I grew up in Lagos. I grew up in Nigeria mm. and then I spent a lot of time in New York with my siblings and then I went to boarding school in Kent for most of my teens. And then only really, I've only really lived in London properly as an adult for about 10 years. Um, 
but I think so. So I think on the one hand, a culmination of all those experiences, uh, the foundation of how I how I see the world, basically. And then I think London poses a lot of more introverted sort of questions as to like this idea of kind of being an outsider, you know, being an outsider. I didn't grow up in London, so I'm not necessarily like London enough. And then if I go to Nigeria, people are like, well, you live in London, so you're basically a Londoner. And then even within sort of black spaces, like I haven't necessarily always been in like whatever might be considered like more stereotypical black spaces, if there's such a thing. But um, so I guess for me, London is a real conversation about privilege. It's a real conversation about sort of access to the arts, for example, and it's for me, it kind of influences a lot of the decisions I want to make in my work because I don't think, I think what London shows is that um, our experience is not monolithic. Our experience is super broad. Um, and as black people, we're super dynamic and, we, and we're across the whole spectrum of humanity and life. And I think that what London the influence London has had is kind of just opening my sensitivities more to that spectrum. I think I've always, from all my experiences before, I've always been very interested in people, but I think London kind of has shown that, you know, there is, there is a, a real rainbow of people. And actually London also has this occupancy of like, uh, a, it's kind of like the dominant narrative for, for like blackness in Britain as well. Whereas like places like Bristol, places like Liverpool, places like Manchester, places like Leeds, you know, Leeds has the oldest Caribbean carnival in Europe. Um, and I didn't even, I didn't know that. I didn't know black people lived in Leeds until I went there. So I think London also kind of throws up this kind of monopoly on culture, which I think we, which I think sometimes we need to be careful of when we're sort of talking about the black British experience, because I think London also reminds me that we, we can also marginalize our own people by not engaging with those spaces as much as we should do. Um, but yeah, I think for the most part, it's kind of like a privilege because I think it's such a multicultural sort of melting pot and it, it really, yeah, for me, it just forces me to think a lot. It forces me to think a lot of, like, demographics. It forces me to think of race, sex, gender. It forces me to think of everything in regards to blackness. So I think, I think yeah, it's... it's and also, uh, also uh, economics, because I think in America, because of the scale of America, you know, um, there's there's maybe... This seems to be in, in essence kind of more money to make stuff. Maybe I'm generalizing a bit, but in the UK, because of the culture of Britain, like people don't necessarily like talk about money and maybe there's not a lot of resources because of size. Uh, London forces you to, and maybe it's also just quite a, a, a black thing as well, is that forces you to think of creating with little or no resources and how best to really stretch um, especially as a filmmaker, I always think, I always say the economics of filmmaking, how best to stretch um, your resources to be able to try and compete with other people who might have more access to resources, basically. Um, yeah, and yeah, it's, 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 you know, I think, I think anywhere where you have like a metropolitan city, you would be remiss if you weren't thinking as broadly as this landscape of the city, I think. I think like wherever you live, you can only think, or I don't know, I think wherever I live, I, I think as broadly as where I am. So like, you know, whatever, if there's a bigger city than London, I'm sure if I move there, I would have to think even bigger about what I'm trying to do um, and what I'm trying to say. But as London is, it's not as big as Lagos, but in comparison, it's still a big city. So I guess all those things I'm sort of thinking of um, in regards to how it's, how it's affected my work. But in, in the same way, I think, I think for me anyway, wherever there is 
wherever a lot of my work is interested in because I shoot a lot of stuff in Nigeria, I think that I'm just, I'm really concerned with our humanity, sort of how we're being treated, whether it's like, whether we're living in like a white supremacist state or whether we're living in the shadows of like white supremacist colonizers. So it's like how th that affects growing up in Africa in an imperialist project or how that affects living here. Um, all, all those things always just play into like my thought process in regards to what I'm doing. Definitely, definitely. Um, I, I mean, you know, you, you touched on, you know, the times that we're living in, and, you know, at the moment, we, you know, it's, it's very clear to see that we are living in a strange and unprecedented time. And, mm. you know, I often hear people talk about the fact that, you know, black people in particular are kind of fighting against two pandemics. You know, you've got mm. coronavirus on one side, you've got, you know, racism and, the, you know, the, the, the rise of the far right on the other. And, mm. you know, I think there's a second, there's a third element at play there where it's the inevitable and, you know, the, the impending recession. Um, so that seems to be on its way as well. So I wanted to yeah. ask you, um, it's a bit of a big question, but I wanted to ask you um, your thoughts about how can creatives really respond in this time of unprecedented change and uncertainty? Yeah, man, that's a big question. Uh, so, I, so I would say like, I would say because we're living in such unique times, I think that maybe an aspect of our response to that should be as radical as, as the time is, because, you know, I think what the pandemic has kind of, I don't think the pandemic has thrown up anything new. I think we've always been living in this for, particularly for black people we've always been living in this sort of like coded world where we have to like where we're black amongst each other but we have to perform to the outside world you know and we've all we all know this do you know what i mean when you're with your family you talk one way when you go outside you behave another way um and i think what the pandemic has kind of shown is it's had everyone at least you know for the best part it's had like white people predominantly kind of see the reality of what we've always been talking about to, to a very small degree and i think for us it's it's less incumbent for us to focus on i don't know i'm i i, I don't know if i'm quite radical or i'm quite uh, intense but i th think i have less interest of trying to communicate what has always been my experience with like sort of white people and institution but i do think this time is a really important opportunity for us as black creatives to sort of like come together and like have more conversations about how we can nurture and grow our community as a priority because i think that um i think for a lot of the time what we've always focused on doing is trying to have dialogue with our white allies or with what our white counterparts or with other POC groups we've always been very ex inclusive and tried to have dialogue but I think now I think now is a real opportunity just to focus on ourselves on our community on a lot of how we can strengthen and fortify our community how we can support each other how we can build support systems I think like for example I think I think women have always nurtured this support system amongst each other um and i think you know i think we could we sh we should be looking to women to learn a lot about how as a community in general we can support each other because i think communicating sharing resources sharing um sharing ideas sharing Un understanding of law sharing understanding of finances sh bu and building together helping each other build platforms such as like we are parable i think is is really crucial at, at this point in time because i think you know it this period is like is about a time to kind of stop talking and just start building because i think i think and actually just like stop focusing on the other and just focus on ourselves and focus on how we can lift each other up and build each other's platforms and how we can hold each other accountable and how we can engage each other. I think, I think on the one side, that's the sort of big broad spectrum of what I think 
black creatives should be using this time to do and it's not something that's going to come overnight it's something that like needs to be a recurring conversation in everything we do moving forward because you know I, you know it's quite sad to say but i feel like these images of like police violence and even the pandemic we don't know how long much further it's going to go on for so since since what happened in America with George Floyd, there's been more cases of black people being murdered. So this sadly, this narrative kind of continues. So we need to just figure out how we can um, protect ourselves and protect our community as best as possible first. And once we have like that, once we have that like mass of how, of us like moving together as a unit, then we can speak to like institutions and then we can, have a dialogue because it's at the moment it's for a lot of the time it's too much for like one person or one group of people to have to like deal with you know but if we're all if we have a support system then we can all like back each other and then i guess the second part of that question is what as creatives what we can do sort of individually and i think i think to i think it's a lot of what a lot of us are doing already you know i throughout the last few months I've just been thinking of like, how can I contribute? How can I engage? How can I, you know, make something or do a fundraiser or something. But then I sort of look back on my work and I realized that a lot of the conversations in my work have been like dealing with a lot of the issues that we're kind of facing today. I mean, I think a lot of black people, not just me, we've already been forecasting a lot of this stuff. We've been trying to sow a lot of these seeds in our work. You know, I watched, um, more recently, I watched Jenny Kuru's Rebirth is Necessary. And mm. I'm like, to me, that just feels like prophecy, you know? Like, 100%, yeah. You know, watching her, watching her film is like, yeah, we need to like, we need to end this relationship with how we view ourselves and we need to build something on, on the top of that, which is what I mean in terms of like, we need to end this relationship with trying to have a dialogue with our oppressor and we just need to build this focus on this relationship on ourselves and on the things that make us spiritually, physically, emotionally secure within our community. And then as artists, I think we should just keep questioning and making work that we feel is reflective of our community and the subjects we want to engage in our community. Um, but yeah, I think I think those are very big answers to a very big. They question. are very big answers to a very big question, and <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm I'm really glad you were able to tackle it head on. Yeah, and I think um you know I, th I think you raised some really good points about you know focusing the conversation on us, and I think you know uh, Black British film mm. over the last 40, 40 years has really tried to do that. I think about films like Pressure. I think about films like mm. Burn the Illusion that really um, told us the, the the challenges and the um, and the experiences that black people were, were facing through, yeah. through that time mm. and I feel like there is a responsibility for black filmmakers to to, to carry on that tr tradition as much as possible so 100 yeah. percent I mean I was thinking of like apart from Jens one of my favorite black British films is Babylon you know mm. and like Babylon deals with police it deals with race and it deals with police brutality and that was made in what like 1980 yes yeah. like before I was even born so yeah, I mean, I think like, I th think as creators, like, it's already in the work, it's already in our work. And I think for a lot of, for a lot of our experience, we're always trying to have our voices valid validated to some, to some extent. But I think that actually, the only people that I'm, I get quite militant and I'm like, the only people I'm making my work for is my community. Like, everyone else is invited to view the work because the work is inclusive but I'm speaking to a specific audience and I'm trying to be as unapologetic as possible about the audience I'm speaking to, because I think history wise, you know, we've all learned effectively like white history, but I think it's, in I think it's important for us to equally put black history on that platform. And it's important for white people to learn that history as well, because I think, you know, I always say we have this duality of history. Like one side has like an inflated, sense of worth and another side has like a, and this sort of gaping emptiness of of self-worth you know and actually what we really need to do is we need to focus on the side that has a deficiency and, and just not even a deficiency because it, it's culturally so rich but we need to focus on swelling that side and make making people see that like historically we've been about we've been about that life like you know we've been doing 
we've been doing this stuff pre-colonization, pre-civilizations. We've been already out there creating this sort of stuff. So I think, yeah, I guess another part to answer the question before is like any opportunity to create like a generational conversation, I think is really important yeah. to any project I would want to do as well. Because I think that especially now in, in, in the midst of a pandemic, which is killing like predominantly like black people, I think we need to really archive our elders, you know, whether it's elders from Africa or the Caribbean, but also our elders here in the UK because they're living, breathing like thesauruses, you know, they, they, they have such a wealth of storytelling, a wealth of information, wealth of like, you know, organizing, you know, wealth of ingredients, wealth of just banks of knowledge that we need to be harvesting before, before they, you know, before we lose them, you know, and I think it's, I think as a matter of priority, you know, places like the Black Cultural, Black Cultural Archives and other archives are just really sort of important right now as well. Yeah, very well said, very well said. I mean, just to finish off, I, I, um, I think, you know, one thing that we're, you know, really asking our, our filmmakers to, um, I guess, disclose to us is, um, you know, going into the archives themselves and actually mm. finding two black films, two black British films that have really um, either inspired them personally or from a creative standpoint. Um, so at this point, I, can, I want to ask you for your two uh, black British films that have really either inspired you personally or professionally. Sure. I think I, I, I sort of leaned into them a little earlier. Yeah, I, would say, yeah, I, I would yeah. say Babylon is, Babylon is probably one of my favorite black British films um i'm like i'm like a diehard fan of steel pulse so like i think at a point maybe about 10 years ago i like discovered steel pulse and then i started like mining anything that they were involved in or anything that they were around and then i stumbled upon babylon and i just i just never seen like i just i just at that point i'd never seen anything like it i'd never seen anything that like centralized what it meant to be male what it meant to be black what it meant to be proud and what it meant to be like um fighting against the system you know even just for your day-to-day survival you know in an area in which it was very familiar to me in, in london um and I just really loved it. I just thought it was really rich in texture and it really celebrated and put music at the center of it and very defiant and a really kind of, you know, another, it's not, it's not a black British film, but I'm a big fan of rockers. Like rockers is one of my favorite films of all time, but Babylon is like our version of rockers almost in a way, you know, it kind of really centralizes the black image when it comes to like Rastafarianism. I'm not a Rasta, even though I have dreads, but I think there's something about that image that I really I really, I'm really drawn to, and it really like makes me feel proud and is, is an image I want to sort of like embellish within my work. And I guess the other one is uh, Rebirth is Necessary. I think, I think it can't be understated like what Jen made, you know? I think that that film is like our North Star for a lot of us. Yeah. Um, especially as being, especially as British filmmakers, I think that film, that film is doing so much work like consciously subconsciously like with like iconography with images with words with archive like that film is like speaking to you on a human level on an ancestral level on you know and i think it's very easy to to see it as just like a piece of film but actually every time i watch it i feel a little more like cleansed almost yeah, yeah. you know i feel like Every time I watch it, I'm like, damn, why is it taking me so long to watch it again? Because it's mm. so uplifting in what she, in what she, you know, because I, I, I look at Jen as like, she's more of a medium, you know, like, I feel like ancestors just like come through a whole, a few of us or a lot of us and just really like permeate. And as, as a filmmaker, it's really important. So I think, I just think what she said is really important and it's a really complex thing to put out there what she's tackling a very like complex and and quite simple, but also quite complex um, ideas. And that sometimes as black people, we, we might feel very aligned to like our existence being like, this is the only way for us to live. And this is, and the way we're nurtured is the only way for us to like understand and see the world. 
but that film literally saying that no like the way we see the world we need to just we need to just deconstruct and we need to like reestablish what it was that's always worked for us and what existed pre us being sort of like given this otherworldly point of view and i think like i think that's such an important thing to 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 say as a filmmaker or just as such a gift to filmmaking um so yeah i think i think those two films probably i think those two films probably have like more of the biggest influence on me and i think maybe a a, th- a close third is like handsworth songs i've only seen yes. it once mm. but i just remember it being i just remember it being a lot you know i just re- remember it being very emotive and very um yeah and just yeah i can't remember the specifics of it but i just remember it, seeing it and being like wow i've never seen anything like it which kind of made me really like focus on the black audio film collective but yeah i think those two are probably my, my my the ones i would pick yeah definitely i think handsworth song is 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 certainly something that's i mean you can see the parallels in that film to what's going on today and what's happening yeah. in america so it's it's just such a such a timely piece of work and yeah. and a timeless piece of work so yeah um great choices and i like where you snuck in a third one there so, um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, yeah no i mean the choices that you've picked are absolutely incredible so yeah i um, mean at this point i can only i'd like to i'd like to thank you for being a part of who we are and and can you tell us a little bit about what, what you're up to next oh sure um I've just, I've, I shot a short film in February uh, with BBC Films. It's like my first narrative short. It's called Lizard. I shot, um, it's produced by Pot Boiler, um, Andrea Calderwood's production company. Um, should be finished within, by the end of the month. Um, and then I've got, um, it's produced by Rachel uh, de Gavro And, um, I have another narrative short, which is commissioned by Film 4. We haven't shot it yet because it's been postponed, but it's produced by Fiona Lamptey and Fruit Tree Media. Um, And yeah, it's part of an anthology that she's producing on Film 4. And then um, what else? Um, I've got like a short commission with Somerset House, like a visual arts thing. it's a film about um, film about my mother and, and sort of how I view like the aging process um, within sort of the black space and someone I care so deeply about. And then what else is there? I think those are probably the main three things that I'm most looking forward to, uh, most looking forward to sharing, most looking forward to completing. Um, and then, yeah, hopefully, you know, at some point, I want to wrap my head around trying to write a feature film, if you know, if if that's possible. Um, And I'm also really looking forward to, hopefully by the time this airs, I will have a niece, you know, touch wood. So I'm looking looking forward to meeting her as well. So yeah, those are the most exciting things in my life at the moment. Well, I'm, I'm really glad that we got you before um, before you get too busy. Um, yeah. So it sounds like a really busy um, sort of six months to a year for you. So um, I can only, I'd like to thank you again for your time. Um, cool. Thank you for being a part of who we are. And we look forward to um, your future endeavours and your future work. Thank okay, you. thank you so much. And I also just want to say thank you guys. I know you said at the start of the call, we've been trying to figure something out for like a couple of years. But yeah, just thank you guys for ch- championing black cinema. I think like platforms what you and your wife do I think is incredibly important and I think similar to what I said before I think like you know it's about you know being able to lend our voices to support what you guys do and just also just tell you that we think as filmmakers we think what you're doing is really important so thank you as well oh, you're very kind thank you so much I can know the Davis Jr thank you no worries have a good day Y O R D A N O S, Yordanos. My grandmother told me a long time ago that there is a saying when it rains a lot um, during the heavy rain season, like monsoon weather in Eritrea, they call it my Yordanos, which means Yordanos is water, and uh, it's, it means a lucky rain. Define myself. Um, I'm constantly growing. Where am I right now? I am 
I am. Do you know me? <laughs> I see myself as a very inquisitive person. I don't feel like there are any stupid questions. I think if someone has a question, then and you know, if you feel like someone else doesn't know better, then teach them better. Like, you know, like speak to people and communicate. Hi, my name is Fumi, and I'm from London. I'm British, but I'm also Nigerian. And that having like that sort of dual nationality, I don't know. I feel like it's like a safety net as well for me. My name is Fumi Lola. My grandma added the Oluwa in my passport. Oluwa Fumilala means God has given me joy. She was like, I want this to be your future. What I like most about being African and particularly like Nigerian is just like such a strong culture and just like knowing that like the heritage that I come from and just like the lines of like kings and queens that my dad has come from and that's been passed on to me and that sort of makes me proud. Hi, I'm Johanna, I'm from Ethiopia and this is my sister. Hey, I'm Jordanos and that's my sister. We're from South London, uh, Kennington, right, right, obviously, South East, don't know. Uh, my mum's uh, like she's uh, from the Gurage tribe. My dad's a mixture of a lot of stuff, but um, his Amara. yeah Amara Oromo. I just know the Oromo have a, they're like really good at dancing, like the traditional dance. They have this like crazy head twist, and it's like the women they just oh, it's just they, you see their hair flying about and their head twisting about, and you think what the hell? Why is their neck not breaking? I'm loving it. I love the shoot. Um, because I, I love the whole concept about how they're, you know, documenting diaspora. Everyone has their own sort of hairstyle from their country and all their um, tribe or ethnicity. And I just love that because there's not enough of that, especially for like people like us who are from Africa. You don't, you just don't get stuff like this. You don't see it. So hopefully, if other girls do see this, they'll make, it'll make them proud or make them feel more comfortable in where they come from. My name's Hannah. I'm half Kenyan, half British. I do have a Kikuyu name, which is Nini, N-I-N-I. -I. I just remember the best part being when I was in Mombasa, the coastal area, that was amazing for me. Really a free being there. Like when you go to Africa, I just feel so much, so free. I feel strong, I, I like my look. It makes me feel like I'm very Maasai, it's a very, I've seen this look on Maasai, or like, you know, men. <laughs> um, so yeah, they have really fine braids, so it's a strong link. My name is Abana. My parents are from Ghana. So my mum's a Khan Akwapam, and my dad's a Khan Brongafu. The similarities that I feel are very personal, just in the way that I feel at home in both places. When I was sitting at the mirror, it's kind of, they made me feel quite regal in a way. It's quite rare to see hairstyles that are like quite intricate with natural hair. You know, just like the effects of modernization, isn't it? It's like a natural course for styles to change with the times. Hello, my name's Naomi. I was born in London, but my family's from Congo. Uh, my mum's um, half Moloba, half Swahili, and my dad's fully Moloba. I was 18 when I went to Kinshasa. It was amazing because everything was totally different from like my everyday life. The culture was different, the food was different, the vibe was different. Everyone was so welcoming. If I could bring back some culture from Kinshasa, it would be the dancing and the food. The dancing is just really refreshing and just brings so much joy. I'm Elizabeth. My Nigerian name is Osamede. I've lived in South East London all my life. I haven't been to Nigeria. Never. It's really beautiful, like heartwarming, honestly. It's been beautiful seeing everyone looking amazing, glowing. Beautiful black skin. 
we're beautiful. And we have a lot of culture which like people love to embrace. I feel strong about it. I feel like a lot of people like to play it down and say, oh yeah, we're black and we're living in the UK and we're suffering this and we're suffering that. But honestly speaking, I feel like it makes us stand out. Like, we're so strong. Yeah, I've seen that a lot in my parents and just hearing about like all the stories that they tell us about their mums and their ancestors. I just feel like we're really strong people.